cats are distracting. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I feel very prepared. I don't. I don't feel prepared at all this time. I've been very spacey all day, unfortunately. Yeah. Would you like to introduce it? You seem to keep being the one to introduce it. I know, because you just kind of sit there looking at the camera, <laughs> and I go, is she going to say anything? Is she get No? All right. Hi. We watched iRobot from 2004. You remember the date. I did. It was the last second. feel like a 2004 movie i mean it doesn't feel clarify it feels like the future but the movie the way that it's made feels like it was made in 2004 and there's a good amount of matrix references in this movie that aren't overbearing yeah and that's how you know it's a 2004 movie <laughs> i don't know it was a fun movie that's it was a start, good movie start with that it wasn't like <laughs> the previous one it wasn't like the previous one it wasn't like the previous two movies actually that's true like Terminator was enjoyable to some extent. Yeah, Terminator is enjoyable. It also hurt in some ways. It's an uncomfortable movie, but it's an enjoyable movie. Unlike the previous, previous movie, Bicentennial <laughs> Bicentennial Man, this movie, it shines. Which is surprising because I didn't remember it this way. So we should say really quickly, I, I watched this movie a long time ago. Yeah, I've watched this movie once and it was possibly 2004 when I saw it. <laughs> It's got uh, Will Smith. The basic story here is we have a detective. Mm -hmm. Detective has been called to an apparent suicide. Mm -hmm. Detective does not think it's a suicide mm -hmm. and investigates. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the full setup. It, it just so happens that he doesn't like robots. That just wraps himself up with the detective story coming to a conclusion. It's as simple as that, mm -hmm. which makes it a fun story because it's not overly convoluted. Yeah. You can follow it, which you can't <laughs> always say about detective story. Because it's a believable future. God, is it? Jeez. All the clothing you go, oh, that's weird. But it makes sense. Natural progression of fashion. Sense. Yes. And we get a trench coat. We get a lot of trench coats. We got we get two trench coats in this movie. One is completely leather. It's a good look. And the other one looks like it's made of duct tape. <laughs> it's a better look. It is a better look. <laughs> There's some good looks in this movie. Yeah. Will Smith dresses how this character feels. And that is, I don't give, I don't care about you. I don't care about you. I'm just here to do my job. The dream sequence is really cool. It's the right amount of confusing. It's all very dreamlike underwater images flash. I remember the hand at the end of it, but it's just like changing mm -hmm. quickly. Mm -hmm. I think it's always useful when movies show you repeating dreams, like shot for shot. This was mm -hmm. a pretty similar repeat when it did it. Mm -hmm. And it reveals more each time, yeah. little by little. Yeah. Hilariously transitions to him waking up with a gun in his hand. So, which he does twice, by the way. He he has this nightmare, and then he wakes up, and his alarm goes off, and he goes, and he wakes up, and the gun's just in his hand, <laughs> and he turns his alarm clock off. And it's like, with oh. the gun hand? Yeah, is that correct? Yeah. He turns it off with the, with gun, the gun hand. hand. Okay, great. There's a slight suggestion there about his feelings about having to go into work every morning there. He's turning it off with the gun hand. He's got issues. He's got issues. And some of them have to do with the way that the world perceives him versus the way he perceives himself, I mm -hmm. think. The character's name is Spooner. There's no joke in that. Yeah. There's no joke. It's just his name. Uh, his first name's like Dale or something. Dell? But they just call, everyone calls him Spooner or Spoon. I like that better. We should just call him Spoon. I mean, it's what Shia LaBeouf calls him. I think that gives us permission. This character of his, Spoon, he feels much more like a detective. Almost on the edge of being a hard-boiled detective. Mm -hmm. Really close to it. Really, really close. Like a hard-boiled, they are there to solve their mystery mm -hmm. no matter the consequences. He's a good detective. Robot shrink lady. Robot shrink lady. Lady, yeah. as I'm going to call her, because I don't remember her name. It was hard enough to remember Spoon name. So anyway, Lady, as I'm yeah. going to call her, she's fun. She is so into technology being made that when she interacts with old tech, she's just like, 
Hello, computer. She prefers tech over the people. Mm-hmm. And yeah. then she finds out he's a cyborg. Uh-huh. He's a cyborg. He's a cyborg. He's a cyborg. First real cyborg. Real cyborg. Not kind of pretend Mm -hmm. like Terminator was. This is a real cyborg. Whole left arm, a couple ribs, and the left lung. Which is interesting because he, we watch him self-repair that arm, but it's camouflaged. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of fun too. That is fun. Yeah. Yeah. It's also his secret shame. So to be combined with them, it's clearly it haunts him. It's part of the dreams that he has. And the memory. The reason that he feels shame about it is very believable. He tells us the story of why he hates robots and why he doesn't like his cyborg arm. He gets in a car accident that's not his fault. It was Mm -hmm. a semi-truck and it just happened to be bad timing on everyone's part. A robot just happened to be walking by and saw this and it's the robot's rule to help the human. And the robot chooses to save Spoon because Spoon's chances of survival are like higher 40 and the little girl's chances are 11. And Spoon is upset because yes, that makes sense, but that's not the right course of action. The course of action is to save the little girl in his eyes. Yeah. This is the sort of scenario where if Spoon had been much, much older, but his chances were still good, the mm-hmm. robot would probably still have picked him, even if he only had like 10 more years to live. This is Spoon's problem with the robots. Quite understandably, instead of deciding what feels humane, what feels feels human, the robot's only going to work off of logic. Because of that, it's going to not pick a small child that we would normally go way out of our way to try and save. And to him, that's unforgivable. His issues with it are understandable. And so the arm is replaced with a robot arm and now it reminds him constantly of the fact that these robots are unreliable in a really important way. So I'm going to just talk while you're drinking because I can. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so we're combining like detective story with technology and really it only gives us one genre to play in which is tech noir such a niche genre there's like three movies in it and you know it, it's not to say that like oh it's, it qualifies as that but it doesn't feel like that it does feel like that there are moments mm-hmm. it doesn't always no again sometimes it falls into the matrix trap of looking and feeling like the matrix but hey i mean it was the matrix you get We're just like, you know, driving on a motorcycle towards a gothic bridge in the middle of Lake Michigan. So there's just all sorts of options here. Mm -hmm. Also back streets, alleys, sort Mm -hmm. of like dirty city scenes. The big gothic windows. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All these things like the vibe, it's there. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's not like in your face. Some like noir stuff, there's no escape from it. Every scene feels noir. Mm -hmm. Not every scene in this movie feels noir. For instance, uh, his apartment Mm -hmm. doesn't feel noir. No. You're in that apartment and you're like, this is just a guy who lives in this apartment. Like Gigi's house? Yeah, Gigi's house. That's his grandma, by the way. Gigi's house feels like a grandma's house. It feels like a grandma's house. This is a grandma's house. house. Mm -hmm. It's a grandma making you pie. It's really good at being tech noir. (laughs) Yeah, in a likable way. The fun thing with tech noir that nobody really does, even like the five movies that are in the genre, (laughs) they never use the tech in the noir part. It's always Mm. just the noirs in the tech part. But this movie does that. The breadcrumbs are all tech based, but they're also based on like a noir thing. Mm -hmm. And it's really integrated well. He interviews a ghost that's a hologram. Consists like it's a a reoccurring thing. It's not just once. AI hologram program thing. Yeah. And that's cool, by the way. First of all, yes. Cool. Just can we more please of that? I like that. Mm -hmm. Also, I just have a real fondness of like when somebody has to like talk to one of these pre-programmed AIs things where it's a recording and then the recording has to say like, this is a limited recording. Try again. I just, mm, I like it. Honestly, there's a lot of really classic storytelling elements in this. I'm going to go ahead as I did in the last one and say that this is because of Isaac Asimov and probably that's about the only reason why. The gothic storytelling elements are the integration of previous stories, very fairy tale like in some ways also the way that this particular plot gets set up as fairy tale like the thing i don't like at the end the fulfilling of the prophecy even feels very fairy tale ish it's not it's not it's not a fulfilling of a prophecy but it is circular it is circular and sure it, no look that's sort of the fairy tale element mm-hmm. when the thing in the fairy tale comes to be mm-hmm. okay sure uh-huh i understand that it's We disagree on this point. We've got Hansel and Gretel. We've got Hansel and Gretel. We've got the Wolfman. The Wolfman gets thrown out and then 
Dracula, but also importantly, Frankenstein gets thrown in again. Mm -hmm. And this is Spoon coming back going, but that's just Frankenstein, right? Mm -hmm. And he's equating the robots to Frankenstein, more or less, as this creature that's sort of learning to come into itself. And that's pretty much the whole, like, conundrum of the film in the first place, is this robot that's been programmed to sort of think outside of the limitations of all of the other robots. Mm -hmm. And this leads the robot, whose name is Sunny, Sunny. to wonder about stuff that robots normally wouldn't be wondering about. <laughs> Which sounds like we're talking about the last movie that we covered. But it's different. It is it's different. It's different it is than Bicentennial different. Man. It's not the same thing. It's not the same thing. Thank goodness. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> you know, we've got other sort of like classic sci-fi stories that are curious about what about if robots are conscious. This one, interestingly, isn't sort of worried about the, the ethics of does this make it this robot a human? Does this reclassify what they are? It's more just curious about like, what does this mean for the robot consciousness in a general sense? So we started watching this movie and I saw robots on screen and I was like, oh, 2004. Mm animation from 2004 and i was like oh boy it's gonna be one of these movies and then almost immediately as soon as sunny shows up on screen or not even sunny just that version those robots those like white porcelain 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 nope the translucenty ones yes <laughs> as soon as they show up on screen you're like ah that's where the budget went because those guys look amazing. Sonny, in particular, has the most work go into him, obviously, because he's, like, a main character and whatnot. And also, he feels emotions, and, and so they have to portray that with his face. And they do a fantastic job. Like, you can see that guy doesn't have eyebrows. Eyebrows mean so many emotions. But you can totally tell what he's doing and what he's feeling. Oh my god, why? I don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> it's going for that point. It's just... just buddy why he does not want us to record oh my gosh he's got a perpetually angry face <laughs> so he's laying on a he's laying on a tabley thing mm. and he's talking and his jaw's moving up and down because he's talking and you can see gears in his head move while he's talking so obviously it's like the mechanism that helps move the jaw mm -hmm. besides just sunny those robots when they're like running around and being crazy they are so cool looking yeah. they do not move like people running around they do not move completely like monkeys or apes running around mm -mm. they've got a little bit of that but they've also got like some spideriness to them mm -hmm. they move in their own unique way they also way. do like leapy things like a yeah. cat kind of sometimes yeah too. and it's very believable looking mm -hmm. a lot of time for a lot of different fully CG characters. I don't know, it's probably just time constraints and cutbacks and whatnot that make it happen, but they never feel like they have a gravity to them, a weight, like they're physically in the world that they're interacting with. Case in point, almost every Hulk looks awful. But with these robots, they move and they interact and they mm -hmm. do their crazy gymnastic leaps and they land and you go, yeah, they landed there. I believe that. Huh. Sonny had blue eyes. All the other robots had yellow eyes, but Sonny had blue eyes. It's because he was special. He was unique. And he was very interested in the fact that he was a special robot. Very much like the kindergartner where the teacher's like, Oh, Sonny, that's such a good picture you drew. And Sonny goes, I'm... I'm a good artist. And you're like, yes, Sonny. A lot of like robot childishness coming through. The interesting thing about Sonny is... He has that dynamic, that childish, I'm learning the world as I go, mm -hmm. right? Like, he learns about winking, and that's brought that up cute. later. And he's like, what's that mean? And Will Smith is like, uh, it means you trust somebody, and it's brought up later, and it's mm -hmm. a good little comeback. So he's got, like, that childness, but then he's also like... What does it mean to be real? Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, a little more complicated than a child. Terminator was a robot who disguised himself as an android. Bicentennial man... Bicentennial Man was a robot who One. became an android who maybe became human at the end. <sighs> this movie, they're robots through and through. There's no confusion on it. There's no trying to get around it. There's nothing of that thing. It's mm -hmm. just truly a robot. They're referred to as robots. They're not even called androids nope. in this movie at all. Mm -hmm. They're mm -hmm. just called robots. Mm -hmm. And it's refreshing. Mm -hmm. Spoon eats only sweet potato pie and coffee with far too much sugar in it. Man likes his sweets. He ate five pies in the movie. There's not a lot of extra space. In the, I mean, it's a two-hour almost movie, and yet 
Not a lot of eating happens in it. Yeah. The only eating, in fact, that happens in it is of pie. Do Terminator, you know? remember she's making a sandwich. She's making a sandwich. We see stuff at the diner. Right. It's interesting to see food in movies and talk about it because it's actually quite fascinating. It's such a universal concept. And like, so. Bicentennial Man was very like at home, so there was tons of food scenes. There was. There's only sweet potato pie in this movie. <laughs> this man only eats sweet potato pie that his grandma makes for him. It's a lot of pie. She hand makes that dough. It is a handmade pie each and every single time. He wakes up at the beginning of the movie. He gets up. There's a pie on his side table. Yes. He walks out. He eats another pie. He goes to his grandma's house. He eats pie there. He is walking down the street uh -huh. when he sees a robot running past with a purse. He's got in his hand at that moment, it's just, just pie in his arms. Pie. He's just, holding a pie and he's, he's eating, eating it, it while walking. He sees the robot and he decides he's going to chase after it. So he shoves the pie in a random man's hand mm -hmm. one more time. One he more goes time. to his grandma's house one at a later time. point and eats a pie. And he's like, you make the best dang pies. And she's like, ooh, hoo, hoo, hoo. you could come out now. And then the robot comes out and it turns out the robot made the pie. And it's just as good as her normal yeah. pies. And he gets very upset at that rationally from that point in the movie. Yeah. And... That's all, all the pie, pie he eats. This movie, it wants to be quirky, and it is. Speaking of a quirky choice, yeah. can we talk about the house being destroyed and carrying a cat? That's a really quirky choice. Yes, please. It was the best. Not the best scene in the movie, surprisingly. No. <laughs> this house is getting demolished by a big robot. He sees a cat, and it comes up to him, and he's like, I don't... I don't... I'm not taking the cat. And then the building starts getting destroyed and he scoops the cat up and he starts running with the cat. And you can see in like the far away shots as the building's being destroyed, he's holding a stuffed cat. And at one point the cat gets away and then yep. he finds it again. Yeah. And it's like a whole thing. Yeah. He shoots a wall, he makes a hole and he bashes through it and he with lands a in a fan with fountain. A oh yeah. And he gets out of the fountain and he's holding this wet cat and this cat is angry <laughs> and he's like patting it like, it's okay, buddy, it's okay. <laughs> And then he gives the cat to his grandma. <laughs> <laughs> Quirky, huh, movie? But it does it well. It does it well. No, I'm, I, again. Movies it's... don't always do it well. No. Cough, cough, Terminator, the lizard. But, like, this movie actually this did it well. fun and cute. The whole, like, theme of the film, if we were going to say there was a theme, it's trust. Yeah. You know, from Spoon's trust of robots to Spoon's trust of other humans agreeing and realizing with him, like, mm -hmm. what's happening, mm -hmm. to the lady's trust of humans versus robots, to Sunny trying to trust to do the right thing. Like, mm -hmm. all of it's just, it's just all about trust mm -hmm. and sort of asking the question of like can we trust something that's different than ourselves mm -hmm. really an interesting question to ask it is all about trust oh and spoiler alert it also works with vicky because everyone trusts oh, vicky. vicky and and it's a trust that shouldn't have been placed right vicky the ai that's sort of the network controlling all the robots yeah it, the Vic, vicky stands for something they said it i don't remember what it is anymore doesn't matter his name is Vicky. Her name is Vicky because she's got a feminine voice and a little feminine face in her big Rubik's Cube square when she shows up. <laughs> it's interesting, I guess, that the question of like, can we trust this thing that's so unknowable to ourselves? And that's sort of like the big takeaway from sci-fi in a general sense is this is sort of our fear that we yep. have with it. Yep. Yep. And it's a fear that we create because we create the robots, obviously. Yeah, it's a fear of ourselves. Very rarely will you have the fear of the robot that comes from space. And it's either other life forms or an invading force. An invading force that's sort of almost semblanced as like, oh, it's like, this is an analogy for humans that are scary to us that we don't know that mm. are invading. Gee, we should talk about this. And this is the analogy of the fear of ourselves, mm -hmm. of the unknowable side of ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what the text sort of is representing for us, because mm -hmm. it is a consciousness that came from our own consciousness. Mm -hmm. No? Yeah. I was voiding this man. We gotta. We, you promised to talk about it. Three mm -hmm. laws of robots that Isaac Asimov wrote originally in iRobot. Asimov's first law says that a robot may not injure a human being or, through inaction, allow a human being to come to harm. Asimov's second law is that a robot must obey the orders given to it by human beings, except where such orders would conflict with the first law. Asimov's third law states that a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law.
Yes. Asimov's short story compilation, also titled I, Robot, covers the consequences and possible issues within these three laws. Particularly, the stories are interested in how the laws can intentionally and unintentionally be manipulated to create technological advancements and to be used as programming errors. Of note, the laws, in their simplicity, allow for ambiguity in definitions of what is robot, in the sequencing of priority between laws, and in the potential for creating conflicting actions. I, Robot, the film, doesn't directly talk about these problems. Rather, it manifests Asimov's zeroth law without explicitly stating it. Asimov's zeroth law is that a robot may not harm humanity or by an action allow humanity to come to harm. Clearly, this is what the film is setting up as Vicky's main hangup. The zeroth law allows for Vicky to rationalize her previous inaction in the face of knowledge of crime or danger that humans experience doing everyday activities as the impetus for ordering all humans to stay home, likely indefinitely. The ambiguity of the term humanity allows Vicky to see individual casualties as admissible when securing overall safety for the majority. Interestingly, Sonny? I don't know what he's got going on with his programming. I'm not he's sure. His, he's his own thing. Does he have any laws happening? Like yeah, his that's programming it. is completely and fully autonomous from any kind of restriction. He has self-preservation. We see it happening. But it has nothing to do with that first or second law. And we see him working to save humans, but mm -hmm. we also see him working to harm humans. Mm -hmm. And he certainly listens to almost no one unless he chooses to. Mm -hmm. How apocalyptic are the those robot van things. They are, they are. They're like buses or something. They're like on little hangy racks inside of there. It's spooky. They all have, all the cars in this future are really cool. They've got yeah. really cool tires. Because the tires aren't tires. They're just like big spheres with honeycomb pattern. Yeah, and somehow that gives them traction. I'm not sure exactly. I'm but... sure there's some kind of magnet thing going on. Magnets are crazy. No one understands magnets. They only had what seemed like one actual car prop. They were cool though. Out and they crashed cool. And then Spoon gets yelled at by his boss. Mm. The Spoon gets really mad at some <laughs> random dudes who are in the background because they looked at him kind of funny because this man has a... Okay, because this man has been, this man being Spoon, this Spoon, Spoon, Spoon in the story this wise has just escaped from being crushed in a building with a cat. And then he kind of walked around and he kind of already had a concussion at that point. You could tell he was bleeding from his head. Like He's definitely got a concussion. And he gets in this really amazing car fight with robots and he crashes his car super, super bad. This man's got a double concussion by this yeah, point. Yeah, second side of his head's bleeding. And the pa paramedics are like, sir, we just we want to make sure you're okay and he's like i'm fine and they're like i mean i guess so and they walk away <laughs> and he just starts like everything's like, fine by the way yelling at these random dudes because they're looking at him in concern they're like i don't know if that dude's okay i think he's got yeah i don't know and he comes over and he's like what are you talking you're talking about me i don't care about you and then he like storms off the other guy turns to him and he's like Upset, you know, concussion. Robot on robot violence was really cool in this movie too. Oh, and also apparently it's still a theme. By it's still a theme. Robots hurting other robots still a thing. It was sad in this movie. In it the was. last movie, it was scary, and in the first movie, it would have been funny if it happened. It didn't. But I was very saddened when the angry, glowy red robots, because they glowed red, were beating up the older robots. I was very sad. Those poor old robots, by the way. They're just living in their little containers. <laughs> they just want to live, man. They just want to live. It's so sad when it gets explained to us that they huddle together. They huddle together. They huddle together because they are scared. <laughs> and they want comfort. And then the angry, glowy red robots see that Will's, uh, that Spoon is there. Mm -hmm. And they start chasing after him. And all of the robots go, Human? Human? We gotta protect the human! Right. And they're like, oh, We're gonna protect you, don't you worry, man! <laughs> it's so sad. <laughs> they're so... Yeah. You're just like, Man... Man, Lady is in the shower. Mm. By the way, I really like that we don't see her. She is, the glass is fogged up. We don't yep. see her. When Will Smith was taking his shower at the beginning of this movie. No such. No such thing. We saw full side of naked body. Yeah. 
It was a fun He's contrast. paid for that. He's paid for that. But also, I like that they didn't objectify the woman about no. it. No. Anyway, so she's in the shower, right? And she gets a call from Spoon, and she hears it, and she starts to come out of the shower, and the robot picks up the phone and... Like, takes it off the receiver. Yeah, so it takes it off the... the receiver and, like, deletes the phone call so that she can't hear this news. And she sees the robot do this, and she's the most vulnerable right now. She's wrapped in a towel, and that robot could kill her even if she was wearing wearing like Iron Man armor. She's like hides behind the door and she she's just like, slowly Who was that? Robot's like wrong number. And she goes, oh, <laughs> yeah. Oh boy. And that's when she knows it's over. It's over. That trust between her and the rope. Mm-mm. It's gone. So something that was really interesting about Spooner's character, we've already talked about how it's understandable that he hates modern tech for his time period. And we understand his reasoning. And also, gosh, Gosh darn, if we don't just watch this whole movie of the robots actually, like, starting to become bad and him being like, see? And everyone's going, no, I don't see. And he's like, see? And they're like, no, I don't see anything. So it's understandable. But something really interesting that happens is he meets Sonny and he arrests Sonny and then he interrogates him and they have an interesting conversation. After he has this conversation with Sonny, for the rest of the whole movie, he refers to Sonny by his name Mm -hmm. and calls him he and gives him his autonomy. Is that the word? He just recognizes his, his like, self-conscious self-awareness. He, he treats him with that respect. He doesn't like robots, but he still treats him with yeah. that respect. Everyone else... Makes him very likable as a character, too, by the way. Lady? Green Goblin guy? They all... Oh, yeah, we haven't... <laughs> Green Goblin guy is the corporation owner of the robots, and he reminds me of the actor who played the Green Goblin from the Spider-Man movie. There's your explanation. So He lives in the Stark Tower. He does. He does live in the Stark Tower. It is the Stark Tower. They don't treat Sonny. Lady learns to treat Sonny with respect, but for a long time, and the the chief of the police, they all call Sonny it Mm -hmm. or the robot. Mm -hmm. They don't give Sonny the respect of allowing him to have his own personhood. Even though this character, even at this point, hates robots, Mm -hmm. he's still respects that this one has a self (sighs) of the past two movies we've watched i did not care for the terminator first of all because you're not supposed to he's the bad guy i also did not care for (sighs) any of the robots from bicentennial man i felt like really upset when sunny was gonna get turned off yeah i was really scared that he was actually gonna die because i don't remember anything about the plot of this movie. I didn't actually know if he was going to be at the ending or not. Of course he was, but this movie is actually pretty good at holding my interest enough to make me not foresee what's going to happen in a movie. Yeah, yeah. It was not predictable, totally. I I really cared for him. I cared for everybody in this movie, but I really cared for Sonny because he was... We invested a lot. They, they, There were a lot of moves that had us invest into his mm-hmm. identity and stuff. Mm-hmm. And there's this point in the movie where he's about to be shut down and he's talking to Lady and he's like, I'm going to die now, right? And she's like, yes, you're going to be decommissioned. And he's like, will it hurt? And that, oh, that kills me. Whenever a robot's like, will it hurt? That's just, mm, man, you can't yeah. do that. Yeah. That's not man. Man. And Lady was even like, oh. Yeah, no, that that hit her. Because, you know, she loves the robot. There's no bad guy. I, some, there's no good guy. There's no good guy, though, yeah. There's just guys. There's just people and robots. So, Green Goblin Guy. I, at one point while we were watching the movie, called him Evil Tony Stark mm. because he made robots and he had lived it in did, the Stark Tower. It did seem for a minute there like he was the one who was doing all the bad stuff with the robots, too. Yeah. He was absolutely an audience red herring. Yeah. And that was really cool. But he wasn't. He was just trying to do his job, just mm-hmm. like everybody else in this movie is. And he, spoiler alert, dies at the end because... Vicky makes a robot kill him, which yeah. is your problem. But even Vicky, right? Evil AI that she is, she's not really evil. Following her program to an extreme extent. Yeah. He's here. He's our cat friend. <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, what's interesting is the reason that we can say this is not only is it that Vicky, like, has the best of intentions, but done the wrong way. But it's not even the, as it would be in Terminator, like all the technology is bad, even though its ultimate goal is maybe even good. Like this, you know, the ultimate furtherance of the earth without human Mm -hmm. kind destroying it some more. Mm -hmm. This particular one, we get good 
tech. Not just tech that's gone askew and is harming, but we also have tech that is helpful and good at the exact same time, mm -hmm. which is why technology doesn't get to be cast in like a very stereotyping good guy, bad guy kind of a role in the first place. Mm -hmm. It defies it. Also, we get people who are complex. Mm -hmm. We get, you know, like Spoon is neither great nor bad. Mm -hmm. He's doing his job mm -hmm. fairly competently, may I say. Mm -hmm. But he's not like the best person mm -hmm. around. Mm -hmm. And even the lady who we would normally see and she, if, if this was like a very stereotypical movie, she'd show up and she would be kind of great. Mm -hmm. And he's been like kind of a jerk to her and mm -hmm. hasn't realized how great she is and eventually mm -hmm. does realize how great she is. Mm -hmm. That's not what happens. Mm -mm. She's like got misguided trust mm -hmm. and has issues. Mm -hmm. And because of the complexity of all the people, None of the people get to be stereotyped good guy, bad guy either. Mm -hmm. The movie completely doesn't allow for it. Mm -hmm. Everyone's complex. It's like, it's a, it's a good movie because the movie's not complex, but the characters no. are. Mm -hmm. And that's how you can tell a movie is good. Yeah. When it's the opposite, when the characters are very clear and not complex, like when they're very shallow and the plot is super convoluted and complex, that's when it's a bad movie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In a general sense. can think of a couple of them. Yeah. All of Chekhov's guns went off in this movie. Unlike the last movie and even the movie before a little bit. All of Chekhov's guns placed on the table, clear as day. We saw them all. They all went off at the end of the movie. Mm -hmm. Literally, all of them. The gun that Spooner has that he sleeps with. His, his, his sleeping gun. <laughs> he keeps that at his house, right? So at one point in the movie, he loses his gun during mm. the crazy card chase. But anyway, that gun's gone. But he has a gun at the end of the movie. You know where he gets that gun? It's his sleeping gun. All the guns go off in this movie. All of Chekhov's guns, they all go off. It's so great. It's good. It's so refreshing to see. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> I'm just, just, I'm just gonna now. say, yeah, just I'm doing now. At one point in the movie, Spoon's trying to like work his his solving process out to Lady out loud. He's trying to tell her. He's trying to give her the clue so she can follow along with how he's yes. figured something out. And in this convo they have, he says Hansel and Gretel five times when counted. First, he brings it up just because he's trying to tell her about the breadcrumbs, and then he, and then he says it again, and then he says it again. And then he says it again. And I was rooting for that last one. And he said it again. And I was like, yeah, buddy. It was one it was shot too. Really important. It was a one shot that. take. They really wanted you to understand. I mean, this is why I was saying what I was saying about the ending. I know you don't like my interpretation of the ending. But I gotta say, if we're reading the movie, the movie says it's a fairy tale. The movie is very clear about it. Mm -hmm. Nothing <laughs> that scene tells mm -hmm. you it's about a fairy tale. Mm -hmm. And how does it end? It ends by doing, by mimicking, by having a repeat of a visual dream. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. A dream is now a visual, like fully realized reality mm -hmm. how is that not fulfilling a prophecy mm -hmm. I, I know it's an unfortunate thing i'm just here to say it's it's what it is it's i know that it doesn't open with like a book cracking and some person saying once upon a time but like it ends that way no 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 what do you think Did Okay, first of all, the prophecy was already done earlier in the movie. Sonny told him about the place and he went and he walked on the hill mm -hmm. and he saw the robots, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Sonny said it wasn't Sonny. Sonny said it was him. Mm -hmm. That was the prophecy. It already did itself. Mm -hmm. The last one is just a coincidence. I swear. They wanted to do the shot. That's all it was. They wanted to do the shot. The lady robot shrink says to the robot mm -hmm. about his dreams. Okay. Freudian analysis says... The shrink is here to tell you what your dreams mean. And the robot says, well, no, that wasn't me. That was him over here in my dream. And the lady shrink goes, no, that was you. And then, like, much more visually correctly represented at the end than in any other scene, we get that picture that he drew. It's true. I don't know. I don't see it. I know. That's the beauty of it. There's two ways to look at it. Yeah. Actually, there's more than two. There's, there's like a, a million. Probably there's a couple. This movie was fun. Yeah. It was good. Yeah. And the ending was also very good. Even taking away her scene that makes her go crazy. <laughs> the ending was actually just very good. They wrapped up the mystery. Yeah. No, I mean, look, it, it just did what we wanted it to do. They pulled off the mask. Scooby said his line. Mystery solved. I know. It really was what we wanted. It was just a whodunit mm -hmm. in tech noir land mm -hmm. with a lot of pie. A lot of pie. Ooh. 
lot of pie. Yeah. It was fun. That was. It was a fun movie. I, Robot. I, Robot, 2004. Yeah. Yes. What are you doing? He's old. He's a cat. He's confused. He's very confused. He is. They don't like it it when we do this. (laughs) I don't actually like pie. They're not baby little, will this hurt if I give you put the Neosporin on my knee? No, it's not that. <laughs> anyway. What were we talking about? I have no idea. We really went on a tangent there. I just saw the name Shia LaBeouf and then I was like, but. 